Well, good morning or good afternoon. It's officially afternoon, 12.01. Uh, rainy day is good. Settle the dust a little bit. Get some more moisture in the ground. Um, things are melting pretty fast now. Uh, I noticed my back lawn um, mostly is snow free and it's actually fairly dry, but now it's goop and poo. And I know you're not supposed to walk on your lawn while it's squishy like this. It gets compressed, but uh, I, I needed to get that cleaned up and it's, it's drying out really fast. Also later in the summer, I will have my lawn aerated by a local company. Uh, it seems to be a pretty helpful thing, but we can do lawns another day. So um, this thing today is no seed left behind. It's kind of the third part of uh, seed kind of growing thing that we've been working on. I did some classes for Olay, which is uh, Opportunities for Lifelong Education at UAA. It's an adult education class. It's kind of like the community schools or community college thing it used to be. And the first one was a basic seed starting. And then I took a bunch of questions uh, over the next couple classes and I put together more slides addressing specific things for people. So it got a little random, but I was hitting on a lot of different topics that people were interested in. And I tried to clean this one up and uh, shorten it up a little bit too. I, I was over a hundred slides and I'm not going to torture you that much with that today. So uh, hopefully this one you will find valuable. If you've seen the other two, I think it's uh, it's a pretty good fit. So um, I'll talk a little bit today about too what I'm currently doing, and we'll try and just tie that into uh, the slides as they come up. Um, I am starting a lot of seeds right now. I do have my own 16 by 20 triple wall polycarbonate heated greenhouse, which all winter heats the neighborhood and it's expensive and it's gas. But it's worth it now because it's full of green already. We're planting more baskets, lots of seeds starting, uh, overwintered roses, uh, some mint pots, uh, all kinds of things. And I just set up my little pop-up greenhouse too to start putting things out of the big greenhouse because you know, temperatures are above freezing at night now. And things will be okay, like my roses will be all right. So. Lots of fun. It's sort of like my cabin in the woods. Just head outside there and play. So, all right. Well, Stacy, let's jump right in. Here's our little slideshow. This is called No Seed Left Behind because it kind of relates to when you've got a seed packet and you get them all the seeds out of there and you go down. And there's always a couple more hiding in the corner. And I, I feel bad for them if I can't use them uh, to get them out of there because that's that's what they're there for. That's their life. They need to have that water and, and start living their life. So kind of sappy, but uh, no seed left behind means, means just that. And um, kind of a fun way to think of it. I, I think there might be a children's book in there somewhere. So I don't know. Okay, so uh, kind of showing a seed packet again. All right, here's your temptation. Starting about November now, the seed catalogs start coming in. I've got a foot high stack of these. Uh, if you wanna see what I call garden porn, the whole seed catalog from Baker Creek or Rare Seed, same thing. Uh, amazing pictures of things. I uh, love territorial, good guys. Um, it's good to shop around. Johnny's is more kind of intended for market growers in, in many ways, but they've got great tools and great information there too. Uh, uh, Sheepers Kitchen Garden Seeds, nice catalog. It seems like they don't ship to Alaska, so I don't need that catalog. Botanical Interest is also very good. Uh, lots of information there. So in the early days, late fall, early winter, and, and early spring, it's still good to look at catalogs. Uh, right now with catalog shipping though, I've been notified by two or three companies that they're suspending orders for a couple weeks to get caught up because things are flying off the shelves, um, literally off all the seed racks. I was at Bell's yesterday and the uh, Ed Hume rep had just restocked their seeds and Ed had told them a couple weeks ago that he didn't want 
the reps going into nurseries yet. He wanted to make sure everything was safe. So everything's fine as far as going in there and getting your seeds. Uh, the Renee's rack was fairly well depleted. Um, as we talked with Renee a couple Fridays ago, she says there's no world seed shortage. They're just, they're flying out of the catalogs, out of the orders for these companies. And uh, actually next Friday, we'll be talking to Ed Hume. So we'll find out a little bit more about the seed business. Okay. Stacy, there we go. <laughs> Don't get frustrated. It's, it's easy to do. Uh, seems like it's kind of overwhelming. Uh, Good. Penny says diamond greenhouses have lots of seeds as of this morning. That's true. And that's what Renee said too. If, uh, if some things are out, it just will give you a chance to, to try something new too. So yeah, support our local folks. If you can't get your mail order, I'd check locally first anyway, but the catalogs are good to study just to get an idea. And I flag those pages and, and boy, I, I want everything in the catalog. And then I slow down and get back to reality and just select a few things out of there. So our, don't get frustrated by all this information and all these catalogs and, and all this uh, stuff that's going on. We'll just, we're going to slow it down and take a look. So here's uh, shelves I've been talking about. I don't know if we showed them to you in the previous presentations, but thought they were worth taking a look for. So, the 21st century is an after school program with the school district. And uh, I was approached by the coordinator a couple years ago. Well, gosh, it's been, I think, six years now um, to do some kind of gardening program uh, with their kids. These are Title I schools. So we looked at uh, a couple setups. You can get really nice, uh, official looking, and well designed. Uh, seed setups like this, seed growing setups, but oftentimes they don't ship to Alaska and they're about $800. So this is the Costco rolling, what you would call the baker's rack. You get the big wheels on there if you're going to roll them around and we often do have to move them down the hallway from a classroom or to an art room or somewhere to work with the kids. But this is Will on the left and Kelly who's moved on and moved out east uh, as we were first setting these up, I, I guess uh, about six years ago, I think. So we've got the rolling shelves, we've got S hooks and chains, we've got the lights that we worked with Brown's Electric to put together. You've got your basic shop light, that long rectangular looking thing that you see right in front of Kelly there. And then the big hood, the, uh, a reflector hood that's on either side. Inside we have the T5 bulbs, uh, that are red and blue spectrum. And if you, I'm gonna just throw out a name, Dave Badger is our guy at Brown's Electric can help you rig this up. You don't really need the uh, LEDs, um, they're a little cheaper to, to run, but uh, just fluorescent lights are fine. I've talked to a lot of people about this and uh, that's just fine, that'll work well. About two to four inches above your seed rack. I've got this going in my garage right now, I did pick up a, a pretty good tip from uh, a guy that, uh, there we go, some crazy looking dude. They're bathed in light. You can't really see the colors of the light. They're, they're not like the LEDs with, that are so pink that you can't look at them. We had them in a, one of our classes, the people that set up the shelves, uh, that got the lights for us, got the LEDs, but they were making the kids crazy. They're, they're really kind of hard on your eyes. And um, so we only ran those at night, but these guys, uh, pretty nice light during the winter. So kind of a sad light type of thing there. Okay, so 21st century, this is how we do it. These are 17 liter tubs from uh, Office Max, Office Depot. They're called really useful containers. This is something you would store your summer gear in or your winter gear, depending on the season, or if you're a teacher, your Legos and maybe crayons and different things. And uh, we drill holes in the bottom of the tub, use the lid to catch the water underneath because you have to have drainage. And uh, we grow greens with the kids, greens and herbs. And the second part of the year, we uh, a lot of times start some flowers uh, so kids can have something to take home or plant at a school garden. 
but these are nice uh, rigs. They're all set up. Like I said, in my, in my greenhouse, I didn't finish my thought there. My friend at Cobra Tools, uh, he said that he had put a layer of quarter inch plywood over his heat mat. And we can talk more about that. Uh, it diffuses the heat better and kind of tempers it a little bit. And because I've dried out things like in one day in the seed flats. So uh, I just checked mine and I have six flats in the greenhouse right now, more to come. And uh, it's nice and cool in there. So that's one of my secrets too, is start warm and grow cool. So I'll, I'll take them off the heat mat in a couple of days because they're already up once they're emerged. I don't really keep them on the heat mat. I don't want to burn them up. But that quarter inch plywood layer between the mat and the containers has really tempered that warmth. Uh, so I'm pretty happy with that little trick. Okay. So this is after uh, generally 30 days or so. This would be one of Renee's uh, offerings. Again, the cut and come again, lettuce mixes, all kinds of different stuff she has. Cut and come again means that you go down to about an inch above where the plant's growing and snip it off and uh, eat that and fertilize the rest and they'll grow back. And you can do that a number of times. So you can uh, grow some things right on your back deck. And studies show if kids plant it, they will eat it. And we found that generally to be true, except the little boy who said about the kale, I had him try it. He was willing to try it. He said, it tastes like leaves. So, <laughs> Uh, I kind of agree. So, uh, seed potatoes from Mary. I've seen some at Bell's so far. Uh, haven't noticed them anywhere else. I kind of think Diamond might have some. And, and you can definitely call these folks before you waste your gas running around. So, uh, yeah, jump in with the questions at any time, and we'll make sure that we answer those for you. Yeah, so, the Diamond Greenhouses does have seed potatoes. We got some okay. this weekend. Okay, great. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks, Penny. We are a good garden network here. This is great. So the slide is site survey. Uh, this is kind of general knowledge. <laughs> yeah, everyone's running out, Penny says. Yeah, get your seed potatoes. My son-in-law actually wants to plant some in a tub on his deck and is a new gardener. So I had to give him the whole skinny on how to do that in, in tubs. And I uh, hope he gets his potatoes. But back to the site survey, if you're doing uh, outdoor gardening. I do a lot of containers and a lot of things on our deck and in our front yard, but uh, in the ground type stuff, look for spots where water is standing. If you're going in the ground, you know, we, we tend to do the raised beds here or what I call an elevated bed, which is a table type affair you can walk up to without bending over. So that's my distinction of raised bed or elevated bed. If it's an elevated bed or a raised bed, it doesn't matter if the water's pooling so much so but but keep that in mind is it sunny shaded or both that's that's like real estate location 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 is it going to get enough sun you need about six hours of sun for most uh, garden plants N locate your drawings northeast south and west as we said in first grade never eat soggy waffles how to remember that and note on your drawing so this is something you can do now is get out and play if you're making a, a new garden if there's grass on the site, you've got to cut it out. Uh, unless you do some kind of lasagna gardening where you're layering things up and smothering it out, but that might take a couple years. And I would still cut out uh, around maybe six inches beyond the shape of your garden box or whatever you're using because that grass will get back in there and it is relentless. Are there trees or shrubs that are shading? Keep that in mind. Uh, they're not bloomed out right now, but my yard actually gets pretty shady later on in the year. It's, it's wide open sun now. Are there any garden beds at the site? A lot of times at our school that we go to, we have to look for this. There might be garden beds, but they might have been put there by what I call a champion teacher who no longer teaches there because of retirement or transfers and if anybody's taking care of that garden or not it's uh, sometimes they languish so it's good to check it out we, we often see neglected beds at schools any plants that are already there healthy that's kind of an indicator of how they're doing does the site need more privacy do you need to block out your neighbors and plant some tall things 
uh, is water available nearby? That's a huge thing with our school gardens too. We put in a garden at Wonder Park and the water is uh, probably a half a block across a field uh, on school property, but uh, back up at the school. So they've got a giant roll of hose and a shopping cart and they have to roll that hose way, way out to the uh, garden area. So that's pretty critical. You're not gonna water if it's not convenient for you. And, and we can talk more about watering and things too, like with the quick connect hoses and different things uh, that work pretty well. Oh, we have a question about wind. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit here in a minute. Uh, any underground sprinklers or utilities? Call for a locate before you start digging. Who will use the area most, including pets? You can keep, keep your garden designed for that. And does it have wheelchair access? This might be more for a public thing or for looking <laughs> down the road to the future. So uh, something we talked to uh, Tony Gatoni a couple weeks ago in our interview about adaptive gardening. So that's a, a fabulous place to investigate those kind of things. So uh, this is what I'm talking about by a raised bed. It's two by 12s. These are based on Mel Bartholomew's square foot gardening. These are at the Botanical Garden in our outdoor classroom space. Got a whiskey barrel there on the left for some nice annuals that we get a big bang of color right when you walk in the gate there. But these are actually five by four. The, the main part is a four by four box, um, which there's our plan. And I added that uh, one by four little other area. So the first part is 16 square feet and the, the back kind of trough that you see is a one by four, so it's four square feet. So according to square foot gardening, you plant each square foot uh, with his uh, setup that he's got organized. These things, you don't have a bottom on them, you can move them, they can be built off site. Originally, we put that upright framing on the back and then we had used uh, one year some of the small black bird netting and actually a bird got caught in that and was trapped and died and I felt so bad I will never use that stuff again. I will use the big five inch or six inch nylon white uh, spacing trellis material. Um, so we don't even have those uprights anymore. We just push the boxes up against the fence and things grow right up there. So that's how they were freestanding. And we thought, hey, let's spin them around get rid of the uprights back up against the fence and uh, taller plants in the back and the shorter plants in the front, but it works well. I recommend the square foot gardening in this, this uh, type of setup. I'm gonna have a letter in our newsletter soon today or tomorrow on this plant a row for the hungry which is a program that was actually initiated by our own Jeff Lowenfels uh, as a member of the Garden Writers Association which is now called Garden Com C-O-M-M for garden communicators because not everybody is a writer they're blogs and influencers and radio and tv and everything so um, I didn't put ground cover under these boxes. They were pretty much just on wood chips that were put over a area that had been totally cleaned out. But I would dig out the sod there because that that would come back. I'm I'm kind of have mixed feelings on putting ground cloth down or weed mat because I kind of want the interaction. I don't mind worms coming up and doing their job there. So uh, if it's a high weedy area, that might be a good way to go. Um, Jury's still out on that one. I would say no, oh, just quick answer, but get rid of that grass, it'll come back. So plant a row, I'll read my article coming up. This is uh, the kids in the summer camp, uh, one early spring, pulling things out. Riley right there in the red's got a big fireweed already. This is probably the first or second week of June. And I have some chives and that young lady and the pink just to her right. So we'll leave those in there, they're perennial. And I see a little bit of horsetail in that other bed. So that's something that you're gonna see. But these are, are nice beds. And soil is fun for all ages. You know, uh, this kind of shows too that uh, this little boy on the right with the red hat, he could work on that whole other side there because these four inch beds, kids and adults, can reach the middle from 
any side. We have about three feet between the boxes so you can get a wheelbarrow in there and people can work all around there. These kids weren't planting, they were just digging. And I, I love the little girl in the pink hat with the little pudgy diaper, but there, <laughs> they were having a ball. That was a couple years we've done dinosaur kale and because I'm a guy, I love dinosaurs and just had to put some out there. So we were having fun with that. It gets kids excited. If they grow it, they will eat it. And these are, they're, this is supported by a lot of studies. So you can find that on the internet. Uh, there's something else. If you're doing taller boxes, do you need to put rocks under the, I think quite finished that there, but we'll get back to that. As sometimes questions pop up, sometimes they're just sitting there, but we'll, we'll get all your questions. Uh, this rainbow carrots, we did grow. Uh, kids planted these and we grew them in those boxes and they obviously did well. And kids are so excited on our school field trips and, and the kids gardening in the summer camp to actually pull a carrot out of the ground. And even better if they're purple, red, yellow, or white. Uh, lots of fun, good, good fresh stuff. Yes, there will be horsetail. Uh, the thing about horsetail is if you dig it out, it sends out a hormone and it wants to grow more. So uh, best to cut it off, keep on it. Uh, in a garden bed that was like a flower bed, I would definitely mulch to help keep it down too. Uh, it's, we all have it. it, it'll be here, it'll outlast us. So uh, learn to deal with it. And it's great in the woods, it's beautiful. But I don't want it in my garden either, but I would recommend snipping those guys off. So there's uh, early spring of our beds again, just to give you a good idea of those. Again, those can be built off site somewhere and, and hauled in if you've got a, that vertical element, which I definitely recommend. That's why I made the one by four area because we should all be growing peas. It's like the easiest thing to grow. And you know what, these beds too, uh, I do come in early and shovel snow off those, try and get them warmed up. I've tried black plastic and clear plastic and different things. And uh, I think everything helps a little bit to get them warmed up. But before you can plant any of those cool weather things like spinach or peas, you have to be able to grab a handful of soil, squeeze it, and have only like one or two drops of water come out. If it's a total mud ball, it's not ready. And that's the advantage of these raised beds for us in the north is they do warm up sooner than in the ground and they dry out sooner. So uh, definitely recommend it to go with the raised beds and look how nice and neat that looks. So I came up with this a couple years ago, a little dibbler, it's a square foot, one, one square foot plywood with a handle on it. I put sheet metal screws on the other side, 36 of them. So uh, evenly spaced, moisten the soil, punch those in and put one seed in each hole. Normally you do uh, probably carrots would be about the best thing in that. You could make one for different sizes. Um, and actually there's a, a little tool that is sold that can help you with your square foot spacing. But uh, just with kids, this was a lot easier to come up with something like this. And I invented it in my own brain, but very soon it was all over Pinterest and that. So, I mean, just great minds think alike, I guess. It works. So here's a thing from Plant and Plate. It was a website I found that has just a one page quick uh, details of the spacing. So you've got various things that um, carrots could be 16 in a square foot. I, I cram a few more in there, uh, but four by four, you've got a three by three setup. You've got just one big thing can go in one of them. So uh, pretty well organized thing. I would definitely encourage you to look into square foot gardening, lots of information online. And there's an official square foot gardening site too. This is what I would call an elevated bed. They call it the veg trug at uh, Gardener's Supply. It also comes with a top on it that you can make like a mini greenhouse out of it to keep, keep things warmer or to keep out birds and I don't know if that would keep out a moose, but uh, <laughs> it'd be really convenient for a moose to walk up and graze right there. No, no bending. I see some nice Swiss chard in there and lots of different things. So if you're handy, these things 
be pretty easy to build. We have a friend of ours that uh, has been a volunteer, built a fantastic uh, elevated bed. It's at, uh, I don't know which Lutheran church it is, and uh, that's our friend Don. And uh, I'll see if I can get him to share that. I'm sure he would be willing to do that. It built a beautiful elevated bed that looks really slick. So if you're handy, save your back, build one of these guys. Sorry, the photo is blurry. I couldn't find a, a better one. Uh, but that's uh, what they call a keyhole garden, which I think is kind of slick. Um, you've got the two beds on the side. There's a bed across the back, and that guy is putting in in one of the spaces there. Uh, it's an area for composting. If you're pulling off dead leaves or harvesting some things and taking out weeds, you can throw them right in that compost area. So that's kind of a slick deal. So look up the keyhole garden while you're waiting to get out in the yard might be something that would be handy for you. So as I said, it, this was put together in response to a bunch of questions. So this is basically part three of what we've been talking about. And I hope uh, that a lot of you had uh, joined us for the other uh, Lunch and Learns. But this comes up a lot. Uh, it can be a little confusing. So fertilizer management, the essential plant nutrients. There are 17 elements that are essential for growth, primarily from the atmosphere or carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, which makes sense for their, uh, their symbol, the C, the H, and the O. And uh, the reason I'm mentioning that is because I'll explain that in a second. So primarily from the soil, your macronutrients, nitrogen, N, phosphorus, P, and potassium, K. Well, wait a minute, why is potassium K? Well, they already have a P for phosphorus. Potassium comes from an ancient Greek word. Of course it does. Kalium, which means alkaline. And that was, uh, I had to know that. It just bugged me like, why is it NPK? And I'm going to teach you a trick about that in a little bit too. So secondary micronutrients, calcium, magnesium, sulfur, and micronutrients go on and on in there. And a lot of these can be uh, delivered through your wonderful compost that you're making. Um, okay, we'll look a little bit more. Here we go. So NPK, up, down, and around. And I got that from an old uh, thing. What, what was a pay and save when, when I moved to Alaska in 84. Uh, it was the kind of drugstore, kind of the Walgreens of the time. And one of their garden flyers had this up, down, and around idea, which I had not seen before. So up is for the nitrogen, which is for leaf growth. It's growing up. Down is phosphorus. It's for roots. It doesn't tell you this, but it's also for fruits and flowers. So you're hanging fuchsia baskets. You can say fuchsia. Uh, would need a, a higher middle number for flowering. So up, down, and around potassium. The third one is for all around health of the plant. So these are your, your big guys. NPK. They're going to be on all your fertilizer labels. And the smaller part of the label will list... Uh, additional macronutrients and micronutrients in there. So up, down, and around, keep that in mind. So from Julie Riley, I bugged her about this. She suggests these things, and this would be an organic one, uh, which if you're going to eat your food, I would definitely go organic. We don't need more chemicals in our diet, in my opinion. So Axiag granular fishbone meal, uh, so up, down, and around, the up is nitrogen is a five, uh, phosphorus is six and 0.5 for potassium. So the bone meal then picks up the higher middle number as a 15 and really nothing in the, in the last number. Uh, Sulpo mag, nothing in the first or second number, but really high in the third number. So a blend of these guys, and I would just do equal parts. Um, would be delicious for your plants. Here's one from Ellen Vandevis, who's like the queen of gardening out in the valley at the Good Earth Garden School. Really worth checking her out. She offers lots of classes and things too. So look up Ellen at Good Earth Garden School. Uh, I was just asking her uh, as per one of the questions from the Olay class about rehabbing the soil and uh, she, she knows um, of our garden. Um, someone's asking about, can we provide the slides? 
they'll be available afterwards, but you can also take a picture with your phone of the slides. So that might work. So Ellen says soybean meal down to earth, six pounds per square hundred feet. Uh, Alaska Mill has a lot of these individual ingredients. Number two is compost tea. Oh good, take pictures with your phone. Uh, fresh at Alaska Mill, but use it immediately, dilute it, and she sells that too when she comes to town. Liquid kelp and potassium at the given rate, read the label. Uh, soy, soy meal and compost tea within two weeks of each other, they feed the microbes. As you know from our friend Mr. Lohenfels, we're feeding the soil, but not really feeding the plants anymore. Uh, Oh, and Mary Randusky says, you can take screenshots on Mac Command Shift 4. Oh, you guys, are so tech savvy. Um, and she was just telling me that uh, compost tea will perk up everything we have. But go to the source, good garden school. All right, so organic fertilizers, what they do, nitrogen replace yearly, it doesn't stay, uh, used from fish or fish meal or blood, fish bone, feather, meal, soybean, alfalfa or liquid fish, molasses, add to a new plot to feed bacteria, turn plot and spray, a few days later spray again. I probably got this from Ellen, sounds like her. Phosphorus, soft rock, phosphate, bone meal, sea ag, fish bone meal. Uh, question, uh, note to don't use for nitrogen. If you use for nitrogen, don't double it. And the K, potassium, green sand, wood ash, Make sure the ashes are not burning. Sulfate of potash, a K mag, kelp, best soluble C ag. So a whole new chapter to learn is get into the organic fertilizers. But why not? Like I say, if you're going to eat it, I would be careful about that. I did plant uh, some spinach yesterday on my deck in a railing planter, this planter that straddles the, the hand portion of the deck railing. And uh, it'll grow when it's ready. So, uh, and I will treat it with organic fertilizers. Okay. So switching gears again, and uh, like I said, I pared this down quite a bit. There was there was way more in here, so I did my best. Uh, what level or pest of pest or weed activity can you tolerate? Um, we're getting a few aphids in the greenhouse and uh, basically I shoot off with the spray of water and knock them down. And hopefully it'll kind of smother them. They actually breathe. Most insects will breathe by these little holes in the side of their body called spiracles. So if you're using um, any kind of like a soap product or neem oil, a lot of that will actually block these guys and suffocate them. Remember that the, uh, Aphids are born pregnant, so they're hard to get ahead of if you if you don't check it. So I'd, if you have a greenhouse or you're out in your garden, when it's growing time, check daily. Uh, how much uh, horsetail can you tolerate? You know that's up to you. In a garden bed, I would plant thickly, mulch, and snip those off. But uh, big thing when choosing products, read the label. I would go to the least harmful product. You really try not to use deadly stuff anymore. You've got your EDRR, Early Detection Rapid Response. You can find more information at invasive.org. Another great place is our Cooperative Extension Service. They have tons of information on all this. And the extension too, when it comes time to be outdoors, uh, if you have some weird bug or weird weed or something, uh, take it over there when, when we're cleared to do that and they will already have had uh, at least a dozen people bring in the same thing. So you're not alone, they'll, they'll know what it is or they'll find out. So our extension, as I say, is our first line of defense. It's USDA Department of Ag and they work for us. That's our tax dollars at work and they are great people over there too. So uh, good stuff. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing because Emma is just a uh, character, the great, great kid uh, that was in our summer class. I would turn around and we were working in a group or something. Emma's off in the fringes in looking for things. And so she, she didn't mind slugs, a whole handful there, just the little tiny guys. But uh, kids love that stuff. It's, it's good to be outdoors. So, 
handpick those slugs. That's probably the best. Great book for us. Look at that. Insects of South Central Alaska. Where do we live? South Central. And uh, Dominique Collet. And those bugs you will find uh, are in your yard for the most part. Uh, it's not like bugs of the world. Uh, so it's a great book I do recommend. So it's quiz time. Is this a guest or a pest? <laughs> Everybody chime in. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful spider just taken from my iPhone. Pretty good shot there. Uh, really nice. And Sharon, way to go. It is a guest. Uh, and they'll eat the bad bugs and that. It's amazing how much stuff that they do eat. Do not squish these guys. If they get in your house, rescue them. Take them outside. Boy, I wish we had this guy under a microscope. Look at the little hairs on its legs. And I think it's a beautiful thing. So yeah, guest or pest, think about it that way. It's a kid thing. How about this guy? <laughs> guest or pest? Well, look at his abdomen, her abdomen, all full of blood there from, from you. And uh, definitely a pest, but it's in the food chain and also the male mosquitoes uh, pollinate orchids. So, eh still a pest. There's an aphid pooping out a new baby. So they're hard to keep on top of. Uh, an indicator that will be that honeydew, that uh, sticky sugary substance. They're sucking the plant juices out. Bugs have different mouth parts. They're chewing. If you have a plant and has a bunch of holes in the leaves, it's some kind of chewing insect. So that narrows it down a little bit. If it's got this little brown spots, or something on the stem that you can see, maybe some discoloration. It might be a sucking bug like this. They just kind of stick a straw down in there, and drink that plant juice, and they're such little pigs, it leaks out of their body. And that's what is all over. If, if you park under a birch tree in your driveway, that's the sticky stuff that's on your car and on your lawn furniture and places. So, how about this guy, guest or pest? And you guys already know that's going to be a guest. And these guys and it might be, I, I won't attempt to identify it. Beautiful butterfly, though. They show up usually about this time uh, at the botanical garden. And even there was no mud one year. I don't know what they were living on, the uh, minerals from the mud puddles. Where they, they do puddle and look for that. But uh, I don't know what these guys live on until they can fulfill their mission. So Red Admiral, and that says, thank you. Beautiful thing. You know, and this is a, a reminder too, to get outside, get a camera. You at least got an iPhone. I know you do. Uh, oops, tortoise shell. Okay, correction. I, I had something in my mind as a morning cloak, but I don't think it's that. So we'll say tortoise shell. We'll go with that. There is a great uh, butterfly book on Alaskan butterflies too, the gentleman has passed away, but uh, people put the book together. and uh, It's very handy. It's a nice little field guide, but it's a book size. It's eight and a half by 11. Great book to have. And these guys are so beautiful. So plant for pollinators. Now this guy is a pest. This is a spearmark black moth. And these, this is a forest pest. It's not probably gonna see them in your yard too much. So that's something I've kind of learned going along. There's different weeds that you'll see in your yard. There's different weeds for roadsides and agricultural fields, and, and you're not always gonna have the same thing. Same thing with these guys. It's not a, really a pest of a, a garden, but you'll definitely see these out in the forest. They're defoliators. Yeah, looks like Rorschach blots, ink blots. What do you see in there? Any faces or anything? <laughs> Here's another kid with the birch leaf miners. I, have learned when these guys are around and the leaves are falling on the trail at the botanical garden, don't show the kids at the beginning of the field trip because the rest of the trip, they're gonna take those leaves and find the little kind of round splotch and they're kind of in the middle of that, where, where that leaf is. And you hold it up to the light and you, it's like an X-ray. You can see that little guy in there. And this is a saw fly larva. It is not a caterpillar. And that insect book I showed you will show you the difference in a caterpillar or a sawfly larva face. Uh, it's not going to turn into a beautiful butterfly. It's actually like a small wasp. But those are forest defoliators too. And you will have these in your yard for sure. 
keep your trees well watered and probably fertilize would be a good idea last year, especially the water was a problem. So uh, you will see these guys, not the worst thing in the world, but they're, they're around. Oh, now here's a, a favorite pest of greenhouses uh, are the white flies. Probably don't come in your house much, but uh, definitely a greenhouse pest. I got this from almanac.com uh, slash pest slash white flies. You can, lots of information on, on these guys around there. Like sanitation is good. Uh, you know, blowing them off with a stream of water is pretty easy to do. I would use soap. Uh, insecticidal soap or neem oil on these guys. Uh, you, you may not be seeing these too much. Just check your plants when you're bringing them home from the nursery. It's a little cold to leave them outside if you just brought something that's been on a nice tropical vacation in a warm greenhouse and you leave it outside, uh, even though it's above freezing now. I, I, I wouldn't leave them outside overnight yet but uh, you can monitor those plants that way. Don't, don't bring a pest, especially into your greenhouse if you have one. Fungus gnats you're gonna see in your home for sure. Um, these are not fruit flies. Fruit flies have those red eyes, big, big eyes, and a, and a much firmer body, fat little, plump little body. These guys are like nothing. If you like go to smack them, they'll get between your fingers and they'll get away. But if you do get one, they're just nothing. I mean, they're, they're so delicate. They're feeding on the organic material on the top of your soil. So don't overwater. Uh, you can get them, blow those off outside with a little stream of water. Um, you can mulch your house plants too. This is not really a garden pest. This is, this guy's in your house. That was a, a product, and I thought someone told me they're not in business right now, but uh, Growstone was the, the company, and I guess I should follow up and look at that. They called it Nat Nix. Um, I thought they should have put a G on Nix to Gnat Gnix. Uh, but it's, uh, it's sort of like perlite. It just can go on top of your house plants as a mulch, and they can't get through there. But uh, the product is made from... Uh, their factory is located in a landfill. They get all the glass, they grind it up, mix it up with some chemical, like kind of what perlite is. Perlite is exploded volcano rock, and they heat it and puff it up, and it really is a lot like volcano rock, like the perlite. It's not sharp or glassy, but it's made from glass, and uh, I thought it was a great product. They make it also to blend into your soil, too, so you might look around for that. Scale insects, again, this is more of a uh, indoor plant type of thing. Sorry for the blurry picture. Um, these guys, though, I did throw one under a microscope one time and it must have been the mama and it was like a turtle shell. I turned her over and there's all these little baby kind of like turtle shells underneath her and they just kind of glom onto your, seems like palms and things and get these guys and uh, a little alcohol spray get those and wipe them off it's really pretty much physical removal but big thing is on all these guys is check your plants before you bring them into your house or greenhouse another is that a guest or a pest <laughs> this was in my neighborhood a year of abundant snow up on the berm which the moose was grateful for because he could or she could reach the higher branches there which are delicious This is kind of funny from uh, Sutton's when they were in business. We've covered everything and interest is blocked trying to keep the moose from eating us out of business. Sorry for the inconvenience. Oh, that's just such an Alaskan thing. It's pretty fun. We miss those guys, Sutton's Greenhouse. I don't know if anybody's selling plugs like they used to do. Uh, I'm in touch with them in Arizona, so I'll say hi for you. But uh, that was a fun place. You could You could walk up there and take what you want and just throw... Uh, check in the door, a little mail slot in there. That was like the old days of business. We miss you guys. <laughs> Moose damage, definitely a pest. They have teeth on their lower part of their mouth and they just scrape up 
and they might not eat something, but they, they do some damage. And if this girdled the tree, if, it, if, if it was, the bark was eaten all the way around, that tree would die. This probably will recover with, with a big uh, kind of a scab that will grow over it. There's a moose on the loose. That guy's a pest. <laughs> okay, into this, sorry. Uh, that we jumped around a little bit. Not too bad though. I, I did uh, cut a lot of stuff. So, all right, move on to this one. IPM, Integrated Pest Management, Ecosystem-Based Strategy, Looking for Biological Control, Habitat Manipulation, Modification of Cultural Practices, Use of Resistant Varieties, uh, pest control materials are selected and applied in a manner that minimizes risks to human health, beneficial and non-target organisms and the environment. And uh, you can find out more information. Uh, just Google IPM, Integrated Pest, pest Management. And, and again, our local uh, cooperative extension would have some information on this too. It's at least do no harm. Um, this is doing things that make more sense than uh, spreading chemicals around. Again, that is my opinion. Uh, I think it makes sense. Here's one of my rules in life. Stop at the Kool-Aid stand. I have some enterprising young men, Dan and Joe's snack shop. They see me coming. I don't know if I'm the only one that stops there, but it's, I have to go buy that when I come home. So I usually buy a Snickers and a Capri Sun give them a tip, but I always take their picture. That's part of the deal. If they were selling Kool-Aid, I would buy it. There we go. But I didn't say you had to drink it. I drive away and then I, I pour it out because you don't know where that's been or where their hands have been. <laughs> Got to support these guys, entrepreneurs. So plant something. You know, it's <laughs> it's a, a easy time to start almost everything right now. Um, and we've talked about this before, that uh, Johnny's Seed Catalog, Johnny's Seeds, has the seed calculator. You can put in the last frost date, traditionally for us is May 31st, put in 531.20, and the calculator will tell you when to plant things. And really that's just about everything now. And if you really wanna do something today, I would maybe do some herbs, do a little basil or something. That would be easy to do. So this was in Pittsburgh. We had a big meetup thing there. And uh, I remember dancing to something there. This is by email. Happy to follow up and answer questions. And I appreciate your support of the garden. So I can hang out with kids and have fun. And we'll see what uh, the summer will bring. Uh, get back to our school programs next year. And... Uh, We'll let you know about our summer camp and that. Well, let's go ahead and uh, take some questions here. I'm going to hit on the chat and see if this works well. Okay, so uh, tortoise shell, we decided that butterfly was the remarking uh, ink blots, Kool Aid, good one. Everyone, let's see. Stacy, can you do more questions? I'm trying to slide up and. Um, let me oh. stop share because for some reason I can't see the chat when I'm sharing my screen. Okay. So do that. I'm just getting a couple. Sure. Oh, here we go. Uh, so a uh, question about providing the slides. So the slideshow and our presentations will be available for a week. Is that what we say? And I know. Yeah, it'll, it'll depend. Um, Right now, I don't think we have any major recordings happening, so I have more space, but um, at least for this week, it'll be available. Um, I thought we were gonna have them available for 30 days, but uh, they take up too much room. So yeah, you have about a week to, to rewatch it. And as I've told some of you, we are working on getting those onto our YouTube channel. Uh, which I have most of them uploaded so far, and then I'm just in the editing process. So you'll have a chance to go back and um, go through some of those again. But um, someone did have a question, Pat, on when it might be time to plant lupin seeds. Okay, I would probably plant them last fall. Uh, generally, something like that, like columbine, lupin, our wild things, they uh, make their seeds in the fall, they scatter on the ground, they sit on, on the ground, it's called stratification, they get that cold period, 
and um, then they come up at the appropriate time in the spring. If you're buying some um, from a seed packet or something, uh, those Russell hybrids are what you're likely to find. I would plant those now, and I might plant them outside in a seed flat also, uh, unless you want to uh, try and scoot them along a little bit and keep them warm inside. Uh, probably the ones you're buying commercially have already been cold treated or they might not need that, but that's the traditional way. But I'd plant everything now. Uh, and uh, with planting things like that too, Pat, I don't know if you want to touch on just um, lupins can tend to be invasive, um, especially when they're not our native ones. And a lot of what I see around town and in people's gardens are not the native. Um, so just, you know, be aware of where you're purchasing things from and what you're planting. Yeah, the big leaf lupin is an, considered an invasive one that we don't want. The Russell hybrids, I, I have checked before and those seem to be not on the bad list. And uh, they might be biennial also, if you plant them this year, they might not bloom till next year. But the big leaf lupin is, is the bad one. If you got your seeds from the wild ones in the park, I'd plant them now, but I probably best would have been to plant them in the fall. Um, I got a question about pea shrubs, powdery mildew, it probably was. Uh, yeah, that would be a good cooperative extension one just to make sure, get some good pictures. Uh, it sounds like powdery mildew. Um, that would be my best guess. And I'll have to look at something to uh, maybe hose that off or uh, maybe a soap product also, again, something least invasive. I'd, I'd get all the extension though for that one. Oh, protecting from the wind in Bear Valley. Well, <laughs> good luck. Uh, yeah, that's a tough one up there. Uh, you guys, and it's like Bayshore. And my brother and my daughter live in Bayshore, uh, a couple blocks apart from each other. And we traditionally call it Blowshore. Uh, you guys have more wind than they do, but it's hard to do hanging baskets because they're spinning around and getting beat up. Um, just maybe some, uh, you know, tree planting on the edge of your property to, uh, that will grow and, you know, it won't be a quick thing if you plant a seedling, but eventually it'll grow in and, uh, like farmers do down in the States to make a, a little windbreak. Um, yeah, that's a tough one. I don't know, right offhand. Anything else? Oh, how tall does my moose fence need to be? Uh, and how else to deter the moose? There is a product called Plant Skid, S-K-Y-D-D, and is a blood-based product that seems to work. Um, I had a six-foot fence one year of a lot of snow. I watched a moose just step over it, those big long legs, plus it was you know kind of off the ground. So uh, I would say that six foot is a pretty good deterrent. Uh, if you're in a really high moose area, it might add something to that. Uh, our, I think it's 12 foot at the Botanical Garden, our wildlife fence. Uh, it's at least 10 feet, but you know, then you look like you're in a zoo or something too. So you don't wanna get too crazy, I think, and too, you know, really block all your sun and, and, and uh, I don't know if you're in a really bad moose area. It sounds like you might be. Penny, thank you. I think you've been with us before. We sure appreciate you guys. Uh, thanks for supporting the Botanical Garden. And uh, even though this is kind of a new thing and we're trying to uh, be relevant with some educational things, uh, I'm really having fun doing these. So appreciate you guys. We'll have another one for you on Monday. And eventually I'm gonna have some other staff probably do some of these, which would be fun, but I've, I've got a whole bunch of them. Wednesdays, we have Garden Art Weekly. Friday, I've got a garden chatter with Pat Stone. Pat is the uh, editor for Green Prince Magazine. Uh, Pat co-wrote uh, Chicken Soup for the Gardener's Soul. And uh, that's what Green Prince is like. They call it the Weeder's Digest. And I've got some heartwarming stories. There's laugh out loud stuff, but there's also crying stories in there. So uh, he's going to be fun to talk to. He's uh, kind of a musical friend of mine, too. And then next week, I'll have uh, Ed Hume so coming up. 
We have information about our guided gardening hands-on CSA uh, program and I don't know if Stacy wants to comment on that some more, but uh, we sure appreciate it. If you purchase a membership or make a donation, we would love that. We'd love to have you on board with us. We can keep you posted on what's going on, and we we are working hard to make it all really relevant for you. And as I'm saying, gardening is essential. So thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Pat. And just to add on to <clears throat> the guided gardening. Um, it is a, a different take on a, a CSA, if you are familiar with those uh, where you buy into a share and you get fresh vegetables and herbs and things uh, throughout the growing season. Um, and we're, we're calling it hands-on, um, even though we can't have you guys at the garden with us this summer. But um, it will have an educational twist to it. So you'll be meeting weekly with uh, our horticulturalists and they'll be guiding you through the gardening process and what we're doing in the gardens and things. And then you also get um, a share with it. So it's um, kind of like going to school um, with us and then you also get fresh veggies. So check it out. It's on the website. Um, we are starting to have signups now if you're interested in it. But thanks, everybody. Uh, if you joined us late and missed any part of this, uh, I will post the recording to this. Uh, I'll send out a link through email within the next day or so when I get it. And um, that will be available for a little while for you to watch. So thanks. All right. Thanks, guys. We really appreciate you.